Yeah, rock on. Uh, I, yeah, I should have put some heavy metal umlauts over this, right? And that would have been appropriate. Um, <laughs> so, uh, out of curiosity, you've got a choice, right? I can either go through the slides quickly and have loads of time for questions, or I can go quite slowly and have a little time for questions. Um, hands up if you'd like loads of time for questions at the end of all this. Okay, it depends on what you see on the slides. Um, yeah, so just, just throw things if you don't like the slides. Um, who am I? That's an excellent question. I'm Simon Stewart. Um, that's my Facebook email address. Um, I'm on GitHub as well, and I'm on Twitter, because I'm still on Twitter even though I work at Facebook, uh, SHS96C. Um, I work in the London office, which has uh, recently been set up as an engineering office in the last sort of six or eight months. Um, we focus on a bunch of things there, but I work as part of the internal tools team, and specifically I'm focusing on Android developer effectiveness and efficiency. So anything that I can do to help our developers go fast um, as they're writing their Android code is, uh, is basically what I'm allowed to do. <clears throat> um, by the way, if you've got questions through this, feel free to just raise your hand, um, and I'm happy to just stop and, and, and take questions. And the other thing is, if my, I'm speaking too fast or you can't ac understand my sort of quaint accent, um, just let me know and I'll speak a bit more slowly and I'll repeat things if you, if you want me to. Okay? Brilliant. So, yeah, Facebook on Android. Who remembers the original Facebook on Android? It was, it was kind of slow, wasn't it? <laughs> um, it was based on web views. Right, so the, the, the uh, embedded UI component, the web view, um, which was fantastic because Facebook at the time was a web company. The thing that we did most was the website. We were really good at iterating on that website. We could launch it once a day. Once a day, we'd ship a brand new version of, of, the, of the entire site in one go. We now do twice a day for the site because um, you like to go fast, right, and break things or not break things because the problem with mobile is that if you break things, People, you, you can't fix it. Like you do a new release, people get the latest, greatest toy, and there's a bug in it. They may never upgrade again, and they're probably going to give you a one-star review on the uh, on the in the app stores, right? It's a suboptimal experience for everyone. And the UI, the, uh, the 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 web views that we were using for the UI were also giving people suboptimal experience. They were slow. The JavaScript engine in them wasn't particularly advanced. Um, you know. Back in the day, it was only on ICS that Chrome started arriving on Android, and it isn't yet powering the web views. So it's still got that slower JavaScript engine, um, which leads to a fairly unpleasant user experience. And so around sort of mid-2012, we realized that we couldn't carry on doing pure web-based stuff and, and having a, an app that was quite so hybrid. We needed to be more native. Um, and so that's what we did. Problem was, though, that we had a large number of developers who were really quite good at PHP, uh, and not that many developers who were really good at Android or iOS. Um, so what we did is we took a step back, um, and we started training up our developers, and we started uh, onboarding people and offering them, the, offering them the opportunity to work on Android first. Uh, and we took our existing developers, and we ran them through uh, some Android training programs. And we ended up with this. Now. Along the bottom is time, and um, vertically are the number of people who are committing code on our mobile code base. Um, and you'll see it's sort of going up in a fairly linear fashion, and suddenly it explodes. Right, we now have lots of people contributing to our code base, um, and that's a brilliant thing. But there isn't an Android team. There isn't one team who is responsible for developing the Android version of Facebook. Um, and I think this is one of the things that we do that's slightly different from other companies that I've seen. Uh, other companies tend to have a team for Android, right? The problem is that if you do that, uh, you s uh, still an overwhelming number of our developers are on the web. And so that means that they can move faster on the web. There's just more of them, right? If each developer does 2,000 lines of code every mega decade or however fast they write, um, you know, the, 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 one, the, the people with the most code are going to do the most features and, and move fastest. So the thing that we've done, which is slightly different from the ordinary approach that I've seen in other companies that I've worked at before, is that the feature teams own their feature on every single platform. So the guys working on photos work on photos on the web, 
on the mobile web, on iOS, and Android. Now, that means that within the feature teams, there are people who might specialize in a particular platform. Like, we don't expect people to flip between um, the web and Android and iOS all in the course of a single day. But it does mean that the teams are responsible for these things. And it means that when we do a release of a feature on the web, we're far more likely to have parity of the same feature on mobile, which is really important, right? Because if you get something new and shiny on the web, you really do want to use it on the phone. That would be nice, right? So yes, there is no Android team because each feature team is responsible for its own port. Which is nice, right? But what does that actually look like? So I'm going to walk you through a developer's day. Um, and it's going to be an incredibly uh, long developer's day because we're going to go all the way up to release. So I don't know, our, our developer is just drinking a lot of coffee. The very first thing that uh, you want to do is to build the software. Exciting, isn't it? So in order to build the software, what you need to do is check out the source code from our source control system. We currently use Git uh, as, as our source control system of choice. Um, and we're investigating moving towards uh, Mercurial in the future uh, for uh, any number of reasons, but um, probably none of them relevant right now. What is relevant, however, is the fact that we've got two branches that we use day in, day out. Um, and the main branch is master. Right? And that's trunk, that's where every single change lands, um, and that represents the current most advanced code that we've got in the whole of the tree. Um, the problem with master is we don't yet know whether it works. We've let developers check in, and how many of you are, are developers? How many of you have ever written something that worked the first time you checked it in? <laughs> I suspect some of you are exaggerating the truth. <laughs> um, I, know, I know that I have, I have routinely broken the tree when I, I, I check code in, um, which is unfortunate given what I, do, what I used to do for a living. Um, so what we've got is we've got a branch called stable, and that stable branch uh, is, to, is, is known good. We've run as many tests as we can on it, um, and it's a really good place to start when you're working on a new feature. You've checked out the code. It's sitting on your disk. How is it organized, right? And there's a number of different idioms and patterns that you see people doing. Um, some people do like the tiny services thing, and they've got like a separate tree for each tiny service that they do, and they get them to collaborate. Um, I think Amazon work a bit like that. Um, what we do is completely different. We have a single source tree containing every single one of our Android applications. So you do the checkout, and you've got the Java code for Instagram, Facebook for Android, uh, Messenger, uh, you name it. Home is in there. Uh, very exciting. Now, um, and it's all stored under basically two directories, Java and Java tests, because you always have a parallel tree of tests in Java, right? Um, this is great, because it makes sharing code really, really easy. If there's a useful utility function, there's code for doing you know, batching of commands over HTTP so you can make better and more efficient use of the radio. You can take that code, you can share it, and it becomes available very quickly, very easily for every single application in our code base. And that's a fantastic and, and empowering thing. On the downside, it doesn't play very nicely with Ant or Maven or many of the other typical build tools that you see out there. Um, and that's partly because people like to glob. Like, they'll glob the entire source tree, and they'll try and compile it. And that's incredibly tedious, time-consuming, and it kills the times of your incremental builds, particularly when you've got four or five applications worth of source code sitting around in there. To work around this problem, we've built ourselves our own custom build tool, um, which is sadly kept under wraps, um, and I can't show it off to you. But I'll tell you this, it's rather spiffy. It's designed uh, entirely for Android, uh, and it is meant to enable incredibly fast, correct incremental builds. Um, and it's a thoroughly pleasant experience. And it integrates quite well with IntelliJ, which is the IDE that we tend to use most. Um, I know a lot of uh, Android developers use Eclipse. We use IntelliJ. Good, excellent. So you get given your feature. Uh, you're on the uh, fancy new feature team, apparently. Um, what does your day-to-day -day, uh, workflow look like? Well, it begins with you checking out the code, um, and then from stable, um, doing a git checkout and creating a new branch of your fancy new feature. Uh, you hackety-hackety-hack. Uh, 
which I believe is the technical term for programming, but I could be wrong. Um, and then you think it's all ready, you uh, commit your fancy new feature, and you have a play. Um, but while you've been doing all this code, because it takes time to write code, and we've got 1,500 developers at Facebook, right? So other people have been checking things in. So you probably want to rebase onto the latest version of Stable just to make sure that you know a critical fix hasn't come in or someone hasn't changed an API that you're using. So you rebase, and then you continue hacking on the feature because you realize it doesn't work at all. You commit a checkpoint. Um, and then we rebase. We take our individual changes and we squash them down. And why is that? So um, what this means is that when we come to do the commit into the final tree, we put a single logical change into the tree that encapsulates the entire feature rather than the individual steps that we took to get there. Um, this means that if there is something wrong with that feature, we can pull it out with a single commit rather than having to go hunting and go, was that check in there part of that feature or that feature? Because hopefully you'll have more than one piece of code in a release. So we rebase and we crunch everything down into a single commit. And then we run this command, arc diff. Um, and arc diff basically sends the code out for a code review. So the code needs to be reviewed, but you need to write it first. Um, and there are a handful of design patterns that we use throughout our code base. But the one that um, is most prevalent and most widely used is dependency injection. Uh, is everyone here familiar with the concept of dependency injection? OK, not everyone. So um, there are two ways of an object to get its collaborators, the things it needs in order to, to do what it needs to do. The first way, and the, the oldest way, is um, a pattern known as service, uh, service location, which is typically implemented on top of singletons. And in that, in the body of your method, you, you've got a, you access a singleton and you get the thing you want, and you just grab it. Right? The other way is dependency injection, where you declare either through constructor arguments or through setters, through mutators, that your dependencies need to be passed in. Um, and those dependencies are given to you. Now, why would you prefer one over the other? It doesn't really seem like a huge difference. In fact, dependency injection sounds worse, because you're going to end up with these massive constructors, right? Because every single one of your collaborators is passed in. Now, the advantage is it makes it really easy to see which, uh, what the collaborators are, and to make it really easy to replace those collaborators when you're writing tests. So if you're, using, if you're writing tests, you're writing mock objects, then being able to just switch them in really easily is, is a really powerful feature. So we use dependency injection throughout our code base. Now our code base is pretty old, um, and common dependency injection frameworks like Juice um, or Spring or Pico Container, um, those, those standard JRE ones, they depend on using reflection quite a lot. So they're relatively slow uh, on Android. Things like RoboJuice and Dagger, which, have, which has come out recently, um, are significantly younger than our code base. So we've got our own dependency injection framework. Um, if we had our time again and we were starting right now, we probably wouldn't write our own, but we have. So you've written the code. Probably doesn't work, because that's code, right? Um, you need to test it. Uh, one of the important things at Facebook is we don't have a separate QA team. We don't have the role of software engineer in test, or SDET, software developer in test. Um, you know, those are curiously disempowering things, because it puts test in someone's job title. And that means that if your job title doesn't have test in it, it's not your job to do testing. right? Um, it's the developer's job to test things. We ask our developers to write tests for their own code. What kind of tests do we ask them to write? Well, the main kind are unit tests. A unit test is particularly fast. Um, it wraps a single method in a, in a particular object. Um, and these tests run in tens of milliseconds. They tend not to do a lot of I.O. or any I.O. Um, they tend to be incredibly self-contained. Because we're using dependency injection, it's really easy for us to swap in the collaborators of a class and verify that, you know, given the system is in this state and this happens, this thing does the right, the right thing. Um, which is an incredibly vague way of describing using mock objects, and I apologize for that, because I should do a better job of describing mock objects. Um, we use the library EasyMock for our mocking. Um, there are a wealth of options out there, um, but we settled on EasyMock. Um, again, this is a decision that was, that was made a while ago, and the state of the art moves forward, and at some point we'll revisit it probably. But for now, EasyMock. We run the tests themselves in JUnit. 
Now, several good reasons for using JUnit. It integrates well with every single IDE out there. It's not TestNG. Um, and Kent Beck works for Facebook, and he wrote JUnit. It seems polite, doesn't it? <coughs> so you do these things, and we're running on the desktop, and, and we're running the tests. And the second you hit any class in from the Android jar, what happens? You get a runtime exception with the word stub in it. Um, because the Android jar that you're given in the, in the uh, uh, SDK um, just contains the ABI. It doesn't contain any implementations. That's uh, less than ideal when you're trying to write tests and you're trying to move quickly. Now, what you could do is uh, use um, the, the, the activity tests and run the, the, the tests on the device itself. But compiling the code, then converting it using DEX to Dalvik, then putting it onto the device, then running on the device, and attempting to debug that is a thoroughly, thoroughly unenjoyable experience. So we'll try and keep everything on the desktop. And the way we do that is we use a library called Roboelectric. Um, Roboelectric provides shadow implementations of most of the classes from the Android jar. Um, and that's kind of useful and kind of powerful. So these unit tests run incredibly quickly. Um, they, they're, they're really nice, uh, and they don't cover everything. So in order to make sure that we've got decent coverage, that the units actually mesh together properly, we write larger tests. Um, that, by the way, is a, a plane called the Super Guppy, and they used it to transport the shuttle around. Um, I think it's a fantastic... Uh, seeing one of these things fly is amazing, because it's like the bumblebee, right? It shouldn't be able to fly, and yet somehow it does. Um, so we write these larger tests, uh, integration tests and end-to-end -end tests. So we do do some um, of the activity tests that come with uh, Android, and we use JUnit3 for that, and we push onto an emulator or a device. Um, and we also use a little bit of Robotium, which is an open source library that allows you to sort of poke the interface. It looks a lot like Selenium RC. Um, and from ICS onward, there was a new framework called UI Automator that shipped with um, uh, Android. And UI Automator goes through the accessibility frameworks and allows you to poke the screen uh, and, and prod the device as if you were a user going through um, the disabled uh, user functionality, which is nice. But the problem is those UI Automator tests, again, need to be compiled, pushed onto the device or the emulator and run from there. And they take a long time anyway, right? So the feedback loop is really, really slow. So one of the things that, we've do that we're doing at Facebook is we're developing a uh, framework of our own that runs on the, on the client side, on, the, uh, on, on your actual device, uh, and uses a long-running UI automator test to uh, allow you to incrementally develop your test without having to redeploy to the device. So you get a nice, fast feedback loop on your tests. It becomes a, a far more comfortable experience. Does that make sense? Cool. If it doesn't, feel free to come and pest me afterwards, because I think it's cool. Um, we will at some point open source that when it's sort of been beaten up a little bit, because you know we want to make sure it's fit for purpose before we put it in front of the world. So you've tested the code. You're ready to commit, right? Well, you remember we sent a code off for review with arcdiff. Um, arcdiff is a command uh, that, that's a, a, a counterpart to uh, open source collaboration tool called Fabricator. Fabricator allows you to do uh, online code reviews. It also has a wiki. It can also allow you to um, keep track of bugs. It also allows, it's, it's like the Swiss army knife of these things. It's like, you know, uh, a, a Google code or something in a box, right? And it's pretty handy. Um, and we use it a lot for the, for the code reviews. Uh, here's an example in incredibly blurry text. Um, you'll see that the change has a number in the, in the sort of top left-hand corner there, um, and that's what we use to track it. Uh, the person who's done the code has put a summary of the changes they've made and why they've made them, and then they've put a test plan. You're not allowed to put any code in our code base unless you have at least acknowledged the fact that there should be a test plan. That's a really useful thing. What's happened here is the reviewer has asked for a couple of changes. Those changes have been made. And then finally, the reviewer has accepted it. And you can see the reviewer has accepted it because there's a green bar at the bottom. And green means go, right? So this is ArcDiff that has kicked off this code review process. And we go onto the Fabricator and we do the code review there. Now, the killer feature 
of Fabricator over every other code review tool that I have ever used are image macros. Uh, you can put pictures of kittens in, you can put sad pandas, you can put whatever you want. Um, these are two of my favorites. It's uh, Obama playing a guitar in the shape of a bald eagle uh, and really rocking out. And I don't know what it means, but it's quite good fun. Um, and uh, we sh we've now finished the code review. You should ship this particular thing. Image macros, killer feature of Fabricator. Definitely worth having a look, if only for that. Like I said, Fabricator has a um, command line tool uh, called Arcanist. And Arcanist um, is what you invoke. It runs on, on Linux uh, and OS X, and I've never tried it on Windows, so it probably works on Windows as well. Um, in order to actually get the code into, uh, into master, what you do is you run the command arc land. Now, you could do the steps that it does behind the scenes, because basically all it does is it checks out master does a pull, make sure you're on the most recent version, merges your branch into, uh, into master, does a push, and then deletes the branch. That's all it does. Well, it does a bit more than that, because it also runs a linter. Right. Uh, that linter that we use is, uh, can be invoked separately using arclint, and it's based on Android's own lint tool. Um, we've added a couple of extra checks to it, though. So uh, we annotate fields with nullable that are allowed to be null. And there's an expectation that if you haven't used nullable, then the field cannot be null. And we've added a lint check for that. We've added a lint check for common programming mistakes, like accidentally using an API that's not available in Gingerbread yet, because we still support Gingerbread. Um, or sometimes there's sort of an API that's been deprecated, and we spot deprecated usages, and we suggest using a more recent version and giving guidance to our developers on how to do that. Um, you know, and there's a host of other things we do. But that means that the code that goes in meets um, sort of certain quality bars uh, and, and should be clean and should work. Say the word should there. Because once it goes in to our code base, you're not done yet. You remember I've been saying, oh, you use the stable branch whenever you're working on a feature. We've got um, a build bot that uh, sits there and basically sets up the stable branch when all the tests go green. Uh, and you'll see that one of them hasn't gone green. Bad developer. Uh, BuildBot is open source. Uh, you can download it, have a play with it yourself. Um, it's pretty widely used. Like the Chrome team use it for, uh, for their build waterfalls and stuff like that. Uh, if you're not practicing continuous integration right now, really, it's a fantastic practice because there's no way that a developer would be able to run this suite of tests on their own, on their own machine, because we build every single application in the code base whenever um, a change lands. Uh, and then we test on a variety of different devices uh, and on the emulator. And we can do regression tests and things like power consumption uh, and things like that. So the build bot sort of is, is the final gating factor before you know, whether we think your code is any good. And by code is any good, what we actually mean is, does it pass our automated tests? Which does suggest, by the way, that you could make your, your code appear to be really good by deleting every test in the system. We've conveniently put them in one tree. Hopefully, no one does that. So we're pretty sure this code is good. What next? Well, we do a process known as dog fooding. Um, it's a charming phrase that I believe comes from from Netscape back in the day. But essentially, all it means is that we uh, use our own software that we've been building day in, day out. And that's kind of important, right? Because uh, most of the people at Facebook, they get an option of an Android phone. And they go, what would you like? And they go, can I have a Galaxy S3? Or could I have a Galaxy Nexus? Or could I have a really modern device? Like, I don't want to be using a ye olde worldy phone from uh, 2011 or 2012, that would be awful, um, totally unsustainable. Which means that most of the developers are running Jelly Bean or Ice Cream Sandwich, right? They're using very recent versions of Android on very capable hardware. Um, and that would be fine if Gingerbread didn't have 44% of the market. And that's the new figure from, from Google, like with the, the new way of measuring these things. Um, Gingerbread is still massive, hugely, hugely popular. So in order to make sure that this is OK, what we do is certain members of staff um, 
actually have a gingerbread device as their main phone. And one of the members of staff who has a gingerbread device as their main phone is the release manager for Android. We get to hear pretty swiftly when we foul things up. <laughs> Um, and typically, the problems you run into are like gingerbread devices have less memory, um, the, res the screens aren't as, as high resolution, they've got less storage, and it's pretty easy to just sort of accidentally run out of memory or try and occupy too much storage, right? Um, and having people using a device t telling you that is really useful. So how do we dog food? What we do, this is, by the way, the double-headed PHP hammer. I just put it, we don't actually use PHP on Android, obviously, but it's such a good photo I had to include it, sorry. Um, so how do people actually get the dog food? What they do is uh, they enable the uh, allow apps to be installed from untrusted um, uh, places setting on the developer, um, uh, developer uh, options, and then they download the APK. When they fire up the APK every day, what it does, so it does a quick check to see whether there's a newer version. And if there is, then it prompts, a, it prompts them with a nag screen going, I can download it for you if you want, and when it's downloaded, can you install it? So we get people running on the latest version pretty, pretty easily once, they, once they've got hold of the, um, the, the, the latest builds. If they want to file a bug, what they do is they pick up the phone and they shake it. And they shake it like this. They're going, tap, tap, tap. It's not working! Which is why we call it a rage shake. Um, and that brings up a sort of simple dialogue that walks them through finding a bug that gets sent up. Final thing, releasing. Um, you've got the option, right, when you're releasing software of uh, features, quality, or schedule, uh, and you can pick any two. It would be nice to pick all three, and I guess marketing might occasionally ask you to do it, but it just can't be done. Um, what we tend to do, time-based releases, we favor quality and we favor the schedule, and so we're quite happy to drop features. Um, how does that process work? Well, what we do is every four weeks at a known time, we cut a new release branch, and we spend three weeks stabilizing that. So we do a bunch of work on that, on that release branch. If a feature isn't ready yet, we yank it, um, which means, that, by the way, that every feature has an off switch. So if we don't have to delete the code, but we can, we can wrap it up um, in a way that it just won't ever be compiled into the app, and we can use ProGuard to strip out symbols. Uh, I see you're wearing the, the jumper there. Good work. Um, so yes, time-based releases. So we spend three weeks stabilizing. We do a week with a release candidate, which goes out to broader testing within the company, and then we upload to the Play Store. So the really nice thing about this is you know that if you get your feature into that branch, it's going to ship in up to three, three or four weeks' time, and you're never waiting on somebody else's feature to do your release. So it's really nice, because if you miss that branch as well, you know that you've got another opportunity coming up in, an, in a month. Um, and that's enormously liberating. It allows you to sort of iterate nice and quickly and at a pace that's appropriate for the technology you're working on. And finally, you know, it's worth bearing in mind that done isn't just for native code. While we're going through the release process, um, there are a few things. Like, we don't accept design changes. Things in the release branch should be ready for releasing. If there's a design change coming in, it implies the work isn't done. Logging is really important. If we add a new feature and it suddenly causes the app to crash far more readily, if it consumes more memory and, and we get ooms, um, that's bad, right? So we need logging to be there. If logging isn't there, we can pull out the feature. Some changes need server-side changes as well. So it's not enough to have the feature working on the phone. It also needs to be pushed onto the website. And it needs to also work with the older version of the app and the new version on the website. Right? You don't want to release an app and then suddenly have everything break for everyone out there, other than the handful of people that have already done the update. Uh, and finally, we take privacy really, really seriously at Facebook. So all the code goes through a privacy review before we actually push it live and make it available to you. OK. So we have gone through the entire process of building Facebook for Android. Um, it's been at a fairly high level, but I hope it gives you an idea of sort of what we're doing, the tools that we're using, why we're going about it. And if you've got any questions, I'd love to hear them.